Today, I have an exciting collection of stories that will leave you entertained. Whether you're looking to unwind after a long day or simply seeking some inspiration, these stories are sure to do the trick. If you missed any of our previous videos or want to revisit your favorite moments, you're in luck because I have compiled them all for you here. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more fascinating content. And if you have any recommendations for future stories, please share them in the comments below with the timestamps. Without further ado, let's dive into the world of amazing stories. Woman, what's your I'm the client, not my husband, stop ignoring me story? Story 1. Not exactly this scenario, but it rankles me to this day. There was a particular car I wanted, and I wanted it with a manual transmission, which was tough to find in that car. There was one at a local dealer that was near my office, so I stopped in during my lunch hour to see what they'd do on price. At the time, I was a young, professional woman in my 20s. The car was for me, and I was paying cash. I wander in around noon on a Tuesday. No one even acknowledges my presence, though there was no one else in the showroom. Finally, I go up to one of the salespeople and say, Hey, do you still have model car? I thought you had one in stock. The guy looked at me in total seriousness and said in a very condescending tone, Oh, honey, you don't want that car. It has a manual transmission. Let me show you these others. That would be better for you. Um, what the frick? After the initial shock wore off, I looked at him and said, Well, first off, my name isn't Honey. I have a name, which you'd know if you'd bother to ask. Second, I know what I want and don't need you to tell me. I think we're done here. And with that, I walked out the door. I ended up finding the same model, manual transmission, at another dealership about an hour from my house. Totally worth the drive. I did most of the deal over the phone. The salesman didn't give a frick that I was a female. We got to a price we could both live with, and the deal was done. So much better. Drove that car until it died about 10 years later. The first dealership went out of business about a year later. Can't say I'm surprised. Story 2. We were buying a car for me, paying for the whole thing outright, but financing the minimum amount because they ran a deal that got us $1,500 off if we financed through them. We paid the whole note the next month. So of course we had to sit in the salesman's office for an inordinately long amount of time answering questions. The salesman, who was great in every other way because he was a hands-off, no-pressure guy, we walked from several other places when they attempted to pressure us, would ask my husband the questions. My husband pointed at me and said, I don't know, it's her car. Salesman said, of course, but we all know how it goes, right? And kept asking him. So what ended up happening, because we both wanted to get the paperwork signed and get the hell out of there with the car, but we were also on the same wavelength wondering about how far we could go with this, was that the salesman would ask my husband the question. Husband would blatantly turn to me and repeat the question, and I would answer him. Then he would turn back to the salesman and repeat exactly what I'd said. Dude never got the idea that maybe he could just ask me the questions. On the car we bought for my husband a few years later, since we put both our names on the paperwork, we both had to sign. The finance guy saw my last name was different and asked when we were getting married, and was confused when we said, er, uh, eight years ago? Story 3. Not exactly the same, but still not awesome sexism. When we were having our house built, the lady helping us kept saying that the house would have Wi-Fi on all three floors. But we asked and paid extra to have Ethernet cables run to certain rooms. She laughed and said, well, he can have one run to his office, but you'll be fine with Wi-Fi. And I was like, no, I would like one as well. We both play games online, sometimes MMOs, and wanted hard lines run. And she just couldn't understand why a woman would need anything other than Wi-Fi. Just made me angry for her to make the assumptions. My husband is awesome and regularly tells contractors to speak to me about things. My dad was a machinist. My mom worked for a tool company. I've built bathrooms, put shingles on, repaired popcorn ceilings, built stairs, repaired dishwashers, sinks, washing machines, etc. Even things like spackle. He's like, maybe you should do this. You're better at it. He handles the car. I handle the house. Divide and conquer. It's so frustrating when people assume I don't know anything about repairs or tools. Heck, in high school, I took AutoCAD. I'm just glad my husband is very supportive and knows that I am capable of doing things. Story 4. I hope this doesn't get buried because it's my absolute favorite thing. My husband and I were buying a new mattress. It was a joint decision on the feel of it, but my decision for the price point, warranty, etc., because I was paying for it. In other words, all the stuff we actually needed the salesperson for. 
Salesperson was a fine guy, old-fashioned, not overtly rude, but he was definitely talking to my husband more than to me, the one with the money to pay. I noticed, but eh, I'm used to it. I was going to get my info and pay the man, whatever. My husband, bless him, wandered away all floaty like he'd never seen a furniture store before. Weird, but okay. Then he came back and said, Hey, can I have some money? I'm going to go check out the insert dumb little decorative thing in the other part of the store. I was weirded out because I've never seen him care about a lamp enough to go examine it on his own. And also, we don't, we don't do that. But yeah, I said, sure, and handed him some cash. The salesman immediately stopped paying attention to my husband. Suddenly, in his mind, I was wearing all the pants. He started asking me what I did for a living, etc., and I was able to negotiate for a slightly lower price. I love my husband so much. He knew exactly what he was doing. Story 5. Kind of a switcheroo, but I, a woman, sold cars, and a couple came in to buy an Accord. They made it clear it was the wife's car, so I was asking her the questions and getting to know her, but the husband was a controlling bulldozer of a person. He'd interrupt her and talk down to her, and kept trying to bully me on the finances, which I had no control over. He hated it, but I ignored him so politely and patiently, waiting for him to shut the F up so I could listen to her answer. I eventually stopped him and asked her, This is your car, what do you think? He got up and left in a huff to harass the management, and I was left alone to do the deal in peace with her, and it was very pleasant without him. I moved on to work as a victim's advocate for domestic violence. Looking back, I'm sure this was an abusive relationship, but I'm glad I could offer her the kindness and respect she clearly didn't get. And although it was for a short time, it was for something big and important. I think about them sometimes because I got along with her so well and really disliked him, hoping she'd driven that accord far away from him. Story 6 I was the guy in the scenario, but I was at a comic con with my girlfriend. It was her idea to go to the con, as she actively collected comics. I have a pile of graphics novels, but don't usually bother with individual issues. At one booth, there was an indie artist trying to hawk his new book. He saw us both looking through a copy and came over to engage. He started talking to me, but then she asked him a question about the book. He gave a short answer and then tried to talk to me about the book again. She just got an annoyed look for a second and then moved on to the next booth. I set the book down and cut him off to say, Sorry dude, she's the comic fan. I was just looking at the drawings. And then moved on too. Assuming I was the nerdier one was acceptable, still a somewhat sexist assumption. But if you look at the traditional gender split of a comic con, it's a reasonable assumption. But once she tried to engage and he ignored her in favor of a male, then that just showed he was an idiot. And seeing it firsthand, I really kind of felt bad for nerdy girls who have guys gatekeeping nerdy things or assuming the girls don't have the right to be interested in them. Story 7. Went with my then-girlfriend when she was car shopping, and I drove us there because she didn't have a car at the time, but was more than capable of affording one. We get there, she introduces herself to the dealer that came out, and he starts showing us the cars. He starts showing her cars and then would address me when talking about the vehicle, like what kind of engine it has, mileage, etc. She would ask a question and the guy would address the answer to me. I was pretty annoyed, as I'm not mechanically inclined at all. I said, why are you talking to me? The dealer stopped and looked confused. She's the one buying the car, not me. Just so you know, she's a certified diesel mechanic. She knows way more about car BS than I do. Address her, not me. I'm just the ride. He stopped and then quietly talked to the girlfriend the rest of the time. She ended up getting a Jeep Sahara. Story 8. My husband and I had our backyard completely dug up and re-landscaped when we bought our house. The landscaper was an older guy, probably around my dad's age, and my husband and I are pretty young to be homeowners, so I could kind of understand this dude's condescending attitude. When he came over the first time to do the estimate, he almost exclusively addressed my husband, even though I made it clear I was the one who was doing the designing and knew what I wanted done. When the work was done and I paid him, he kept looking behind me for my husband and almost didn't give me the aftercare instructions for the new sod, saying he wanted to make sure it was done right, so he'd email them to my husband. I finally snapped. Give me the dang piece of paper, Bruce. I'm the one who will be home during the day to do the darn thing. I worked nights at the time. He reluctantly handed it over and called my husband the next day to make sure the lawn got watered. My husband told him, You'd have to ask her, Bruce. She told you she'd do the darn thing and hung up. I had indeed done the darn thing. Story 9 My old teacher told me a story about a cold caller. 
A man phoned the house phone, this was around the 80s or 90s when people still had house phones, asking for the man of the house to talk about changing suppliers for something or other. My teacher, a woman, told the man that her husband was away on a business trip and to call back the next day. He called the next day, again asking for the man of the house, and she informed him that her husband had been delayed and to call back the next day. He called the next day and she informed him that due to bad weather, his flight had been delayed until later on that night, so please call back the next day. He called the next day, she put her husband on, and the man asked about changing to his company service. The husband informed him that his wife dealt with all the bills, and please talk to her. My teacher took the phone, said no thank you, and hung up. Bartenders, what's the smoothest pickup lines you've heard? Viewer's edition. Story 1. At college, I used to frequent a cheap, somewhat dodgy bar. Loud music, broke students at happy hour. I went there mainly because I had a crush on a cute, but feisty, short blonde bartender. Which was never happening, because she was she and I was shy. So one day I was out the back, smoking a J. My friends had left, and I was finishing up, when said blonde, feisty girl came out to throw something away. She sees me and proceeds to completely chew me out. Because they don't need trouble with the authorities, yada yada. I said sorry, completely mortified, and went back inside to sit with my friends. Half an hour later, she's just cleaning up the mess left behind after happy hour, carrying a tray full of leftover drinks, when some drunk oaf walks into her. She trips, and all the glasses of leftover beer, sticky cocktails, and Red Bull go flying right over me, mainly my jeans and shoes. So I'm soaked and surrounded by broken glass. She comes over with a look of horror on her face and says, I'm so sorry, it was an accident and has nothing to do with before. I'd never do anything like that. I just looked at her and said, Well, if I hadn't done that before, I might be ticked off now, but so no worries. I saw it was an accident and gave her my best. It's an okay smile. Her face melted from super anxious to elated and friendly. I tried to help her clean up the mess, but she dragged me to the bar and stuck me on a stool at her corner, gave me some wipes to clean up, and instructed her colleagues that my tab was on her tonight. I sat there the rest of the night and happily chatted with the bar staff and her. After doing her rounds, it was getting to closing time, and she leaned in and asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm drunk, I'm high, and now I'm dry and somewhat sticky. She looked me in the eyes, and in the warmest voice, she said, Let's get you home now, to clean you up and get you wet and sticky again. And so it was. We dated for over two years after that night. Very nice, sweet girl. Story 2. I used to go to an old man's bar. Old man bars are places retired men go to drink away their golden years after their wives pass away. The place was great, but you had to respect what the bar was. A place with cheap beer, but you had to be quiet. You could get a big steak for six bucks, but you had to buy at least three beers. Younger people could go to the bar, but couldn't swear or be loud. So there was this young guy, about 21, who looked like he had been beaten up. He was a regular, and the owner of the bar took care of his regulars. When the owner saw the busted guy come to the door and help himself to a spot at the end of the bar, the owner was nice to the guy. They talked to each other all night. There were these two girls, and they were new. They were okay, but they drank too much and got obnoxious. I was waiting for them to get the boot. It was a busy night making steaks and baked potatoes. The busted up guy was at the end of the bar by himself. So the two girls went to talk to him. We were all watching them. We saw them talking, but heard nothing. Then the busted up guy said, Could you leave me alone? I'm not comfortable with you. The owner heard that and told the girls to leave the guy alone. They got offended and started swearing and yelling. The owner pushed them both out and locked the door. They started to kick the door, but the police station was across the street. They were arrested. Story 3 Not a bar story, but my sister had her friends over once for a bit of a party, and a couple minutes in, we were sitting all on a table while my sister and one of her friends are trying to get this chocolate fountain to work. I'm sitting at the opposite end next to me is my boy, and on my right side is her other friend who's eating the chocolate off a spoon. I decide, screw it, let's mess around and find out. So as she's legit sucking on a spoonful of chocolate, I turn to her and hit her with the, dang girl, what that mouth do? To which she replied, oh, you don't want to know. At this point, all sense of self-awareness left my body and I retaliate with, well, I'm trying to find out. 
She giggles off and shortly after had to leave, but I turn back to my boy, who witnessed the entire thing unfold, and he's shocked and is like, dude, what the F? Me, unaware of what I'd said, replies, what? To which he says, bro, I didn't know you were this slick with it. That was one of the smoothest lines I've ever heard. My guy still looking like he witnessed the holy grail of pickup lines. And then what I had said clicks to me, and unfortunately, I didn't have the time to elaborate on that conversation with her, but I would have taken her from her man with a couple more exchanges, I'm certain. Story four. Wasn't me, but a coworker, a group of three girls, regulars, enter, and my brand new third day on the job coworker takes an instant interest in one of them girls. The girl he was interested in comes to order for the three. They were regulars, so we didn't see a problem. He asks for identification. I tell him, she's a usual. You don't need to card her. He replies, man, can't you make it easy to get a cute girl's address? Girl blushes, yada, yada, yada. The girl writes her number on a napkin, but teases him by only flashing it to him for a second as she leaves the counter. What she didn't know was that he has insane memory. Later, he takes his break, walks over to her, takes out his phone, and says... Number, 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 number. Each number one by one as he types them in before texting something, then saying, that's your number, right? Loud, audible ping as she gets a message. I later found out this message read, I get off at 10. I can give you a ride if you need it. Smoothest stuff I've ever seen. Story five. This just reminded me of a time I went to a rock metal club and was dancing in a cage. You can slide in if you're slim, or slide round the back for a bigger gap. But I remember seeing a girl and thought she was cute, then I see a guy following her with champagne. So I thought, oh, she's taken, and carried on dancing. Next thing I know, she's in the cage, I give her a smile and headbang to say, enjoy yourself. She asks another girl if we're together, and she said, he's all yours. The funny part was, nothing happened for a good five minutes, just dancing. Then a bit of chatting. My friend leans over and says, take the hint. Me, being autistic as heck, asked if she wanted anything, like a drink or something. And she said, no. I said, a kiss. Then she started kissing me. Also, the guy with the champagne was a stranger. I don't know why he bought champagne and tailed a girl around, but I know she was leaving soon and was curious about me, apparently. Story 6. A friend and I tried total crap pickup lines when out drinking, and to our surprise, some actually worked. The best ones I'd witnessed were, hey, want to have the best lover around? No? Then I'm the right guy. My dong might not be big, but at least it's thin. I might not know what to do, but I will do it for as long as you want. And some more. I seemed to get along with almost everyone while drunk, so I sometimes just joined a group and started talking with them. Everyone assumed I was the friend of someone else within the group, and many times I'd score, or just have a great evening with total strangers. Best thing about it was meeting them again on other nights out. I miss those days. Story 7. How do you play hangman with someone without saying a word? And how do you get someone to guess your phrase, which spells out, can I have your number? Because, you know, at the beginning of the game, the paper is empty. Imagine someone coming to you with only the underscores and trying to get you to start guessing letters to spell out a question that a person who doesn't speak has. And the only thing that can come out of it is you answering a question or else you fail the game and lose. I mean, if the girl lost the game and didn't get to read, can I have your number? The guy wouldn't even have asked his question to her. What the frick is this stuff? Story 8. More cheese than smooth and of course utterly accidental, because this would never work when I was trying. Introductions. And this is my friend Will. Her. Did she say Will? Me. Slightly buzzed. Yep. As in, wherever I am, there's a way. Can't remember her name, but she was cute. Sober cute, not drunk cute. Also, I was married. So when I found her number in my coat pocket, I just marked it as a win and tossed the number. Divorced ten years later, and no, no one was up to shenanigans. Story 9. I'm not a bartender, but a truck driver since before the story. I went to a bar with a buddy of mine and was there for about five hours total. We closed the bar down, and about 11 o'clock, the upstairs bar, the Harley bar, closed, and the two bartenders up there came down to drink. After a while, my buddy was going on about how big his sausage in his pants was, and then two large numbers, like you got a small one, and noticed I wasn't saying anything. I bet he has a big one. I said, nope, I got a small one, and said, okay, you just got a big one then. 
After that, I drank for free for the rest of the night. The three bartenders is buying me drinks. Story 10. Not at a bar, but in my college classroom, I got a girl's number from my 3D animation class about a week ago without even realizing I got her number, with little more than me simply asking for an entirely different reason. She wanted to stay connected with the class, so I offered her my number in case my social media somehow messed it up, only when my friends and fellow classmates, who were sitting right next to her, complimented me on how smooth I was for achieving that did it dawn on me. Note to self, if I ever have a love interest, I should ask while completely oblivious to my own intentions. What have you caught your babysitter doing? Viewer edition. Story 1. Okay, my parents didn't put up any cameras, but I remember this. I was, I believe, four years old. This babysitter had orangish, medium curly hair and wore a green sweater and these jeans. Basic babysitter attire. I had these wild animal stickers I always used. I took these stickers and put one of them all over the page and went to our couch and sat down. Babysitter. What's this? Me. I will explain all the things on this page. The babysitter was around in her 20s. She graduated high school. She knew every animal. My four-year-old butt must have thought because of how my parents were so excited and happy when I named the new animal. This is because I was practically mute when I was around two and three, only saying and doing things like up, mama, dada, and pointing at things. But I thought they didn't know. Story two. I have a bit of a confusing one. I used to work as a babysitter for almost two years. One day I had to go out of town because this couple was paying $500 to babysit her twins for a few days due to a family emergency. I left my six-year-old son with my girlfriend while I took care of the twins. I have a baby monitor in his room as well as the living room that I never told her about. I suddenly got an alert on my phone, so I decided to see what it was, and I watched my girlfriend yell at my son for some reason. I couldn't make out what she was saying. I assumed he was just misbehaving, so I just kept watching. My girlfriend went to our room, came back, and smacked him across the face. I texted the mother of the twins and told her to come home as soon as possible. She came back around 10.30 after I put the kids to bed and explained what happened. I drove home and cursed the stuff out of my girlfriend. We broke up and now I have a boyfriend that loves my son more than anything. Too long didn't read, I caught my girlfriend abusing my son while babysitting twins. Story 3. I didn't get any of these on video, but my babysitter would mumble stuff about me and my older sibling. Me and my sister of course hated the babysitter, and she also hated us. She would steal our stuff that was just bought recently. She would also leave my younger sister unattended alone in her room, and she would also go into me and my other sister's room to annoy us whenever my parents aren't around. I caught her going through my father's stuff for money, and she would say, I will go out and buy something. But when she returns, I see freaking snacks and chips. Have told her many times not to do things she's not supposed to. But sometimes my father would catch me telling my babysitter not to do this or that crap and get mad at me and say, you don't talk to people like that. Me and my mother discuss this and we can't fire her because we're having a hard time trying to find another babysitter, but hopefully next time we get a better one. Story 4. So it actually depends on the charcoal, because in reality, charcoal is dried bark, or shells, from nuts. Or even nuts all by themselves that are shredded and crushed together under massive crushers that force the plant material together to make charcoal. Source, my dad used to make the charcoal for Kingsford's Match Light Mesquite. Most charcoal is not even slightly harmful. However, if lighter fluid is added to it, then it is deadly poison. But rather, charcoal without chemicals added is actually pretty harmless, except for the sharp edges from the shells. I do not advise eating it unless it's the real fancy stuff that is made from only nuts, and that stuff is pretty freaking tasty, but hard like a jawbreaker. Story 5 One time I was walking down the hallway of my school with this girl and my best friend, walked up and we started talking. He was holding some sort of badge on a lanyard in his right hand and accidentally dropped it. He tried recovering the badge before it fell to the floor and fumbled with it all the way to the ground. In the process of trying to recover the badge, he scoops his hand upwards and gets a handful of my family jewels. I about keeled over from the pain. The girl next to me witnessing the whole thing bursts out laughing and my friend, clearly embarrassed, says, sorry, and then we go on our way. I felt like I was going to puke for a solid five minutes after that just from the pain. Story 6. 
Okay, though, seriously, if I found that footage and found out that it happened in my bed, I don't think it'd be enough to burn the sheets at the very minimum. I would burn the entire bed and get an entire new bed, including the mattress and the box spring. On the extreme, man, I would do what the internet does when a large spider escapes in the house. Well, not actually. I believe that destroying your house over that in that way would be a crime. I would seriously debate moving, though. Story 7. Here's a rule for babysitting, pet sitting, and or house sitting. Always assume that there are cameras everywhere. It doesn't matter if the parents and owners say there aren't any cameras, or if they point out the cameras, always assume there are cameras everywhere. It will save you from embarrassment and potentially save you from any legal problems. This rule has worked wonders for me. Story 8. Question, for story 31, did they live here in the Philippines? Because that's what we call our caretakers, nannies, and household helpers. I dislike calling them by this because they're like family, maids, or sometimes we call them eight. No, not like you just ate something, but it's what we use to address our older sisters. Yaya is what I use to address my household helpers. Story 9. Benadryl in high doses isn't for small children for a reason. I have a prescription of a high dose of Benadryl, and I, roughly 140 pounds, am knocked out and high as frick after taking it. It's for my severe anxiety and autism. It sedates me, basically. I don't think it would harm a small child, but definitely bad for them. Girls, what's something men shouldn't be insecure about? Viewer edition. Story 1. Biggest load of video on this site? Chicks will say it doesn't matter, but toss it back in your face. This stuff sounds like it's coming from people who have never had a relationship with another person. Not caring about someone else's physical appearance is a lie, and is another way of pretending to say you have no standards. It goes so much further than this, but I believe people will listen to some of this stuff and use it to cope with all of their flaws, and not the one or two things they choose to apply it to. It has to be a very small number of women who want a submissive, physically and emotionally weak, and unmotivated guy to baby and tie themselves to, because there is always someone who does want something. For the younger men watching this, the keys to it are, number one, hygiene is paramount, don't reek. Number two, make an effort to improve yourself before and after getting the girl. Number three, if your self-improvement causes hostility from the girl, she is likely not the one for you. Try to talk it out. If it continues, drop her. Number four, a weapon is useless if the hand that wields it is too. Your PP is a powerful weapon regardless, mostly, of size, so long as you use it properly. Number five, have something you're good at and can speak about at length. A woman with no hobbies is beyond boring, and the same applies for men. Cultivate a hobby and become proficient. No, video games don't count. Beer and TV do not count. Art, music, sports. Playing, not simply watching. The study of a particular subject. History, science, whatever. Those kinds of things. It gives you something fun to do and makes you interested. I cannot overstate the importance of this going to interject here real quick and say that video games definitely do count. That's a very interesting hobby in my opinion. Number six, stop slouching, smile a little, hold eye contact for a bit instead of just slinking away. Walk like you have somewhere to be. Fake the confidence until you suddenly realize one day that you now feel it. Number seven, make some kind of effort to improve physical attributes. You don't need to feel bad about being either too thin or too fat until it gets extreme. And you don't need to become Conan, but you should be able to reasonably push some weight around when the need arises. Good luck, little brothers. Don't believe the girls when they tell you most of the stuff in this video. That stuff definitely matters. It's just that your other positive attributes can outweigh the bad. Work on yourself so that your positive points shine, and eventually you'll make it. Story two. To be honest, I'm an athletic 22-year-old guy and never had trouble with attracting girls since my teens, but only when I put on a mask of being hypermasculine, having no negative emotions, and never, again, never admitting that I have problems. The second I start trying to just slightly open up about, for example, my needs being not met, or even worse, having days when I don't have energy and want to sleep for 15 hours straight because of being overwhelmed, or about, like, cuddling more than rough intercourse and stuff, I can visibly see her emotional connection and attraction to me fade away bit by bit. Did I mention I didn't get girls to even talk to me for prolonged periods of time until about 15? When I finally had my abs visible after eight years of martial arts and my shoulders got wider than everybody in my class, time to mention it now, my father pressed me into getting heavy into sports, about four training sessions a week, from eight years old, and kept repeating that I will thank him later. 
If it wasn't for him throwing me into different sections every single day, I would be absolutely screwed. It made me hate sport, but ultimately doing exercises that I hate feels better than hating myself for being a failure as a man. Oh yeah, about dong size, I actually experimented with it. You would not believe the difference in reactions between a girl feeling me inside her prior to seeing it in detail and the opposite. My 16 centimeters doesn't look impressive, even though they are technically enough to please about 90% of women on the planet, and I got the phrase, wow, it doesn't seem as big as it feels, way more times than I wanted to. And more on this, in my experience, only the girls whom you please without caring about your own satisfaction call you back. I now date a fantastic girl, my dream type. But every time we tried my kinks in bed, I felt very negative feedback. She doesn't like it, does it only for me and not for herself, and generally wants it to be over. The worst is when she sees that I'm bugged with something or in a bad mood in general and starts doing it just for me to feel better, even though she doesn't want it. Makes me want to cry. I don't know why I'm writing this, maybe just to say it out loud somewhere for living people to hear, not just in my diary. Story 3. The funniest dichotomy is that, across the board, confidence is considered the most desired trait. Makes sense, people want to hang around people who are fun and bring up the mood instead of dragging it down. But the irony is, sometimes people can't help but feel unconfident every now and then, and when they do, people like being around them less, so they feel less confident because they keep losing people, making a downward spiral. Saying this as an introvert, someone who actually likes being left to their own devices often, For all I hear about, it doesn't matter how often you're rejected, screw everyone, just be confident in you. It fails to recognize that people are what stabilize each other. Edit and never say, if you keep getting rejected, it's obviously a problem with you. Even when it's true, it just makes things worse and kind of proves the downward cycle problem. Especially when the advice is love yourself only for that same person to say, then yourself must not be good enough. You're doomed to fail. Try as we might, we are social creatures, and being alone too much can do some bad things to the head. Sometimes people get left behind one too many, and naturally, it hurts. It's like expecting someone who just broke their arm from a fall to climb their way out. That is, it might be possible, but making that default expectation isn't smart. I say the key is to build solid support structures, people who will stick by you and pick you up in those low points, or just a place where you feel safe, or a hobby you feel confident in your skills on. A safety net so that no matter how many times you're knocked down, you won't break anything and be able to climb back up. Story 4. Hate all this, (laughs) don't be ashamed of your body BS. Yes, some women don't want an aesthetic physique on their guy. However, it's stupid to say not to worry about it. If you had two guys who had exactly the same height, personality, income, and facial appearance, with the only difference being one is fat and the other has a lean, muscular physique, the guy who evidently works out and takes care of himself will be chosen by more women. That's a fact, and exceptions don't disregard the rule. You should never exercise purely for women anyway. It's a shame for a man or woman to grow old without seeing the strength of which his body is capable. Do it for yourself. Use women as motivation, obviously, as after all, the guy who has a better physique will always be chosen more. Exceptions don't disregard the rule. If you're watching videos like this to justify your ineptability to stick to a diet for just two years to either gain muscle or lose weight, you have the wrong idea. Yes, you can still get women without abs, but you will have access to higher quality women if you do. That's the difference. If you're skinny or overweight and you're actively trying to change that, which everyone should be doing if they're within either situation, as it is a disgrace to yourself and those around you to be either. Do not be ashamed of how you look. On the other hand, if you're coping and sitting at home all day eating poopy food or eating nothing at all, as well as not lifting weights and hitting cardio, you should be ashamed. Be your best self by starting to work out and eat better. It is your duty to do so. Story 5. This is all some really horrible advice. Women are the first ones to look down on a man that does anything she sees as remotely feminine. There was a lesbian woman that wanted to pretend to be a man to see what it was like to be a man. She was a feminist and she was expecting that it would be easy being a man. Instead, she found women were extremely judgmental if any of her body movements were even remotely feminine. She was treated so badly by women as a man that it caused her severe trauma and could find no emotional support as a man. She wrote a book called Self-Made Man, talking about it, if anyone is interested. The experience caused her to start self-harming, and years later, she ended up ending her own life. Her demise has been attributed to the trauma she received as her time pretending to be a man. 
I have literally seen several guys mocked and ridiculed by a room full of people because he admitted he was afraid to talk about his feelings, and they began mocking him over feeling that way, thereby proving he had good reason to fear talking about his feelings. I can't even use chapstick without a woman making fun of me. Men have very good reasons for the insecurities they end up with. Most women will say a man can open up to her. The moment he does, she will dump him. On the flip side, a woman that actually would stick by him and support him is wife material. Unfortunately, those women are very hard to find. Story 6. I'm going to come at these from my perspective, and some of the repeats are just, like, for starters, I don't moan. That's not something I hide, it's just not what happens. You hear us gasp, that's not stifling a moan. That is our entire body spasming and preventing us from breathing for a moment, so we are desperately attempting to rend breath from ecstasy. Second, We are not not being emotional because we are told it's bad, at least I'm not. We are not emotional because we are not emotional, at least not in the way we're supposed to be. I won't cry at a funeral, I won't freak out at a breakup, but I was freaking bawling watching Fred Claus, and no, it doesn't make sense. You want to see your man emotional? Put on Saving Private Ryan. Or better yet, that episode of Helsing Ultimate, where the Sir Shelby M. Penwood sacrificed himself for queer and country. That one messes me up every time. I'm insecure about my feminine side, not because I think I'd be rejected, but because I'm single right now, and I don't put off a lot of straight signals. Like, the last time I was publicly excited about something were some cute pillows I bought. Like, I don't think people will hate me, but I worry potential partners will be like, oh, he must be gay, and just never look at me in a romantic way. Or worse, try and set me up on a date. Beards have nothing to do with anyone else. We are insecure about them because, from a young age, we all decide what type of facial hair we will have once we can grow it, and when we realize some people just can't, it's heart-wrenching. Story 7. We alls being like, this ain't actually real, writing is different from words. I have a question for you. Would you be fine dating someone who has these outrageous expectations, forcing you to hide your emotions and crap? No. If you have to force yourself into a mold to be with someone, that's not the right person for you. You're viewing a partner as an object in a sense. You're looking for a woman who'll be with you, not because they like you, but because you're able to keep up a front that they enjoy. A romantic partner should be a friend in a sense. Like a friend, but closer in a special way. I've had friends who've seriously debated telling someone they like them because they were worried if they said no, it'd ruin their friendship. I remember one clear day, he asked me if he should. I convinced him yes, and the next time I saw him, he was shaking from happiness. She felt the same way. They had been friends for about two years. They knew each other well, and both valued their friendship. It sounds like something straight out of a high school drama, but it was very eye-opening to me. They genuinely loved each other. They didn't put up a front to get each other's love. They didn't meet just to date. They were just two clowns who met because my friend had overheard a conversation and jumped in. Story 8 That's all fine and dandy to say, but it's quite obvious that a pretty good chunk of women do not feel the same way and look at men who get emotional in any way as weak, pathetic, and pitiful. Men also shame other men for not being men enough, but honestly, I would claim, without proof sadly, that the majority of shaming comes from women, not men anymore. Basically, every guy I know genuinely cares about a dude's mental state. If that guy opens up... This compares to the amount of times guys who told me that as soon as they opened up about themselves to women, they would sooner or later get shamed, or it was used against them, or that suddenly any kind of romantic avenue was basically blocked. Or in some cases, girlfriends would just break off the relationship, because he wasn't the same man anymore to her. I genuinely believe there are good women out there who care about the mental health of men, but the amount of women who still only have this extremely shallow, narrow-minded view on men's emotions are far too quick to judge, and completely destroy a man's ability to trust a woman with his emotions. The number of them is still staggering. Crazy how much our new generation cares about mental health, except when it's about men. Men's mental health, despite the effort by some, or even many, to make it a serious topic, is still often the butt of the joke in many regards, and never taken seriously. Story 9. The best lesson I got, it's not about accepting your insecurities, losing extra weight or gaining muscles, allowing emotions to flow, it's about self-improvement in all those areas. Are you a skinny guy? Put some effort into being at least fit and healthy. Are you struggling with money? Put in the work and hours. And most importantly, be educated rather than smart. This is what makes the difference when talking to a girl. It's different when you two are having a debate in a friendly, open way. Communication is a skill, and it's strongly linked to your education. 
So educate yourselves, mind your feelings, not too much or too less exposure, and improve overall in the areas you're lacking. I would rather hear that I shouldn't be insecure about my emotions, including aggression or rage. I'm a man, and all these words are nice, but also are empty words, honestly. Reality is different. Also, men are not the same as women, and many of us won't go well without being supported all the time, no matter what. Seriously, we need some expectations, we need challenges, and we need to show our masculinity sometimes. Some men need emotional support, but some also need acceptance of our different nature, which is nowadays called toxic masculinity. Story 10. Guys, if you have a girlfriend or a wife, you don't absolutely have to tell them when they're wrong. Don't humiliate them, but be firm and don't back down. That's called having a spine, and she will fall head over heels for you. It scared the living heck out of me for the first seven years, every time I did it, and thought to myself, well, she might leave. Key point, grow a spine. Also, I was one of the highly introverted nerds in high school. I'm 5'10 and have crippling social anxiety. I'm married, I have three kids now, and my family is about the only thing in this world that I'm proud of. Here's the thing, if you can control it, do so. For example, I stayed active and worked my butt off to get six-pack abs, swam up rivers all summer long, and did karate to learn how to deal with threats. I'm now bald, still have six-pack abs because I learned to enjoy heavy labor and stay active. As I got older, I stopped playing video games because I wanted to. I chose to prioritize my family. Life changes depending on the phase you're in. Also, now my wife told me in high school that I was going to prom with her. I told her no at least a dozen times. I'm glad I went. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.